Hello there, my name is Gary Sims from Android Authority. Now when a smartphone maker designs a phone, he has to choose from a variety of different components, including what screen he's going to use, what battery is going to be used, and of course what processor is going to be used. Now these processors really make up the heart of a smartphone, and there are a variety of them available today from Qualcomm and from Samsung and from MediaTek and from HiSilicon, a subsidiary owned by Huawei. And today we're going to look to see which of these companies makes the best processor for your smartphone. So if you're ready, Let's go. Now before we go any further, we need to look at what makes up these processors. Actually their full name is a system on a chip or a SOC. Now the reason they're called that is because in days gone by, really just the CPU, the central processing unit, was the most important thing in a computer. And all the other things that it needed to work were kind of put on other chips around it on the circuit board. In fact, even back in the days of the 386 and the 486, even the floating point unit, the FPU, was considered as a sort of a secondary chip that you could buy a PC with or without an FPU in it. Now slowly over the years different things got put onto the same die as the CPU. So first of all it was the FPU and then memory controllers and then the GPU and now DSPs until you get in fact a whole system on a chip. And that's why we get the term of course system on a chip. Now we're going to be looking today at five different system on a chip. So first of all we're going to be looking at the Snapdragon 810 from Qualcomm, Samsung's Exynos 7420, MediaTek's Helios X10, then we're going to be looking at the high silicon Kirin 935 and of course we're going to also look at the Snapdragon 801 for comparison. With the exception of the Snapdragon 801, which we'll look at in a moment, all the processors we're going to be looking at today are octa-core processors that use a system called Big Dot Little from ARM. Now, in a Big Dot Little system, you'll find that all the cores are not equal. Some cores are higher performance, some cores have better power efficiency. Now, if you look at a processor like the Snapdragon 810, what you'll find is that it has four Cortex-A57 cores for the heavy lifting and four Cortex-A53 cores for the easier stuff like flicking through the UI or watching a YouTube video. Now there are some variations on this theme, for example two of the processes we're going to be looking at today in fact use eight Cortex-A53 cores and I'll tell you about those when we get into the details of each processor. And we're also going to be looking at the Snapdragon 801 which really was the peak of the 32-bit uh, processor development by Qualcomm. All the other processors we're looking at today are 64-bit processors whereas the 801 was a quad-core processor not, not octa-core and it was 32-bit and not 64-bit. However it provides us with a good baseline so we can see what was possible yesteryear and what is possible today. And of course the 801 was a very popular chip and we'll talk more about that when we get to it in a moment. Now before we dive into chips to see what each one is capable of doing, it's also meant, worth mentioning a thing called the fabrication process. Of course making silicon chips is actually a quite a hard thing to do and it actually takes several weeks to make one of these chips from wafer all the way through to a product that can be sent onto the market. Now as you can imagine the smaller you have to make these chips the harder it is for the manufacturers. Now way back when chips were released back in the 1970s they were using quite different process technology technology to make the chips than we use today. Now for example in 1989 they were using an 800 nanometer process for chips like the Intel 486. Now by 2001 that had dropped to what was known as a 130 nanometer process and that was used by companies like Intel and Texas Instruments for a variety of processes including the Pentium 3. By the time the smartphone revolution was under the way, chips like the Samsung Xenos 3 using the original Nexus S were made using a 45 nanometer technology. Now today that number is down to 28 nanometers and 14 nanometers FinFET. Now the key thing about process nodes is that although they get harder and harder to reach these smaller and smaller targets, there are benefits in making the chips on this smaller process node, including the fact they produce less heat and consume less power. So therefore, of course, the smartphone manufacturers want to get their phones down to smaller and smaller process nodes. And as we go through each chip in a moment, I'll tell you what process node they have been made on. And that is also an interesting figure, an interesting statistic in how well these chips perform when we come to the benchmarks. So let's talk about the Qualcomm Snapdragon 810 for a moment. As I mentioned previously, it's an octa-core processor, an octa-core 64-bit processor that uses four Cortex-A57 cores and four Cortex-A53 cores. Those cores are joined by the Adreno 430 GPU, as well as a DSP and an LTE modem for all that cellular communication. 
Now the history of the Snapdragon 810 has been rocky at best because originally when it was released it was accused of having problems with overheating. Now Qualcomm released the Snapdragon 810 version 2.1 saying that these problems have been solved and to the major part it seems that it has been able to convince manufacturers to pick its CPU as you'll find it in phones like the Sony Z5 range and also in the Nexus 6P. One final thing worth mentioning about the Snapdragon 810 is it's manufactured using a 20 nanometer process node. And we'll see how that compares to the other processors in a moment. So let's talk about the Exynos 7420. And this is Samsung's homegrown chip, again, that uses four Cortex A57 cores, four Cortex A53 cores. However, this time with a Mali 760 GPU with eight shaders built into it. Is manufactured using a 14 nanometer FinFET process and Samsung have put it in their current range of flagship phones including the Samsung Galaxy S6, the Samsung Galaxy S6 Edge, the Plus version of those and of course the Note 5. Now the next processor in our lineup is a bit different. The MediaTek Helio X10 actually uses eight Cortex A53 cores. So it hasn't got any A57 cores, it's all made up of A53 cores, but four of those cores are clocked at a higher megahertz than the other four, and therefore it tries to simulate this kind of big dot little system by having four that can run faster and four that can run slower, even though they are actually the same core design. Now another interesting thing about the Helio X10 is that it uses a GPU from Imagination, specifically the Power VR 6200. Now Imagination doesn't have too much success in the Android space however it's had lots of success in Apple's products because basically all of the current iPhones have used the power VR system from imagination so it'll be interesting to see how this chip performs compared to the others it's also worth mentioning that it uses a 28 nanometer process node now that's quite big compared to the 14 nanometer FinFET and the 20 nanometer systems of the Exynos 7420 and of course the Snapdragon 810 so let's see how that performs when we get to our bench Benchmarks. Now, the last octa core processor in our lineup today is the High Silicon Kirin 935. Now, High Silicon is a company that's wholly owned by uh, Huawei and it's mainly used in Huawei's products, including the Mate S, which is in fact the phone I'll be using for these tests, but I'll talk more about that in a moment. Now, like the MediaTek Helio X10, the Kirin 935 uses eight Cortex A53 cores, four of them clocked at a higher frequency than the other four and therefore simulating this big dot little system. Now, joining those cores is the ARM Mali T628 GPU, which has four CPU shaders. It's also worth mentioning that this particular processor is built also on a 28 nanometer process. I've also included one more chip in our test lineup for today, and that is the Snapdragon 801. Now, it really is quite different to the other processors I've just mentioned. First of all, it's only a quad-core processor rather than an octa-core processor. Secondly, it doesn't use big dot little because it's only got those quad cores. Thirdly, it is a 32-bit processor rather than a 64-bit processor. And finally, it uses Qualcomm's custom core design rather than using a design from ARM itself. And it will be interesting to see how this chip stands up in the benchmarks compared to today's flagship devices. So if you're ready, let's take a look at the actual benchmarks and see what we find out. Now to perform these tests, I had to get hold of some devices that use the different system on the chips that we are testing. Now for the Snapdragon 810, I'm using a Sony Z5 Compact. For the Exynos 7420, I'm using a Note 5. For the MediaTek Helio X10, I'm using a Redmi Note 2. For the Kirin 935, I'm using a Huawei Mate S. And for the Snapdragon 801, I'm using a Zuck Z1 or a ZUK Z1. Now, one caveat, of course, is that different phones may utilize these SOCs better than other phones. However, these are phones that I have, and I don't think that any difference between one model and another model with the same SOC will really affect the overall results. I think we do get a clear picture of how these different SOCs perform. Now, talking of the benchmarks, it's actually quite difficult to do real-world benchmarking. Although I will be using programs like Antutu and Geekbench and another program called CPU Prime Benchmark, which calculates prime numbers, okay, you'll find that a lot of these benchmarks are artificial. They create a kind of a just an artificial workload that you won't see in real life. However, they do tell us what the CPU and the GPU is capable of. 
So I've also included some real world tests that includes uh, running need for speed uh, no limit to see how quickly it starts up. Also to run a web browser test using the Kraken JavaScript benchmark. And I've also written two benchmarks myself, one which performs lots and lots of mathematical calculations, another one that performs a 2D physics water simulation to see how well these phones perform without using the standard benchmarks because who knows, maybe they even cheat. <gasps> Has that been heard of? They even cheat when they see these benchmarks, but they can't cheat on the ones I've written myself. So let's first of all start and see how Antutu fares on all these different devices. Now I ran two Antutu benchmarks on each of these devices. First of all, I ran it when each phone was cool, hadn't been doing anything, probably just been rebooted. And then I ran it to get a base mark uh, level of performance for each of these SOCs. I then let Epic Citadel run in its guided tour mode for 30 minutes with the hope that it might heat up the phone a little bit. And then I ran Antutu again to see whether the heat had affected the performance. And these are the results that we got. And as you can see, the Exynos 7420 is the fastest CPU according to Antutu. Next comes the Snapdragon 810, followed by the Kirin 935, and then interestingly enough by the Snapdragon 801, which manages to beat the Helio X10 by quite a margin. As you can see, after I ran Epic Citadel for 30 minutes, the benchmarks have changed. Now there are two interesting things here. First of all, the Snapdragon 801 actually performed better when it was slightly warmed up. The Kirin 935 managed to maintain its uh, performance level and the other three all dipped slightly. However, even with these changes, the Exynos 7420 is still the fastest processor according to Antutu. Now the next benchmark I ran was Geekbench. Now Geekbench gives us two numbers. First of all, it gives us a single core number, which means the test is running just one core on the phone. So it doesn't matter whether you've got octa-core or a deca-core or a quad-core phone, it will only use one core to run the test and that will tell us how fast each individual core is. It then also gives us a multi-core score, which means it farms out the benchmark across all the cores in the processor and tells us what speed can be achieved there. And just like with the Antutu benchmark, what I actually did was after I ran Epic Citadel for 30 minutes, I then ran Antutu and then very quickly I also ran uh, Geekbench to see how the heat had affected the overall outcome. So let's have a look at the results. And as you can see, for the single core results, again, the Exynos 7420 is the fastest with a score of 1,504. This is followed by, again, the Snapdragon 810. And then this time again, we see the Snapdragon 801 is performing very well, followed by the Helio X10 and the Kirin 935. Now, again, after uh, Epic Citadel had been running for 30 minutes, I reran the tests. We can see the Snapdragon 810 actually did marginally better, as did the Snapdragon 801. However, the Exynos 7420 remained basically the same, as did the Helio X10, with a slight dip only on the Kirin 935. As for the multi-core results, again, we see that the Exynos 7420 is the fastest processor according to the multi-core part of Geekbench. However, interestingly, we find that the Helio X10 has a very good score and in fact beats the Snapdragon 810, which comes into third place. Fourth, we have the Kirin 935 and finally the Snapdragon 801, which only is a quad-core processor and therefore doesn't do so well on a multi-core test. Now again, after running Epic Citadel for 30 minutes, I went away and ran Antutu and then ran Geekbench. And again, we can see that some of the numbers are quite interesting. Again, the Snapdragon 801 did better after it had been heated up. The Kirin 935 also did better after it had been playing Epic Citadel. The other three had dropped slightly, but again, it remains that the Exynos 7420 is the fastest CPU according to Geekbench and the Helio X10 comes in at second place. Now for this third test, I use CPU PrimeMark, a program that just calculates lots and lots of prime numbers and sees how quickly the SOC can do it. Now this time to heat up the process of what I did was I made the initial run and then I recorded 10 minutes of HD video, not 4K video, HD video on each phone and then reran the test to see whether the heat produced by recording HD video changed the results at all. And of course it has, so let's have a look at them. And as you can see, the Exynos 7420 is again the fastest processor according to CPU Prime Benchmark. Next comes the Snapdragon 810, then we have the Helio X10, followed by the Kirin 935, and finally the Snapdragon 801. 
Now after recording HD video for 10 minutes, we find that some of the scores altered, but some of the scores didn't significantly change at all. For example, the Exynos 7420 remains basically the same, uh, and in fact the Kirin 935 does slightly better, and the Snapdragon 801 remains basically the same. The only one that dropped significantly was the Snapdragon 810, which we see had quite a big drop from 20,771 to 18,935. Now, in an attempt to reproduce real-world situations, real-world scenarios, rather than relying on benchmarks, I did a test where I started up the game Need for Speed No Limit. It actually takes quite a few seconds to start up that game, and I measured it on each of the devices to see how well they did. Now, here are the results. The slowest for starting up the game was, in fact, the Snapdragon 810, which was quite unusual compared to the other things we've seen, the other benchmarks that we've seen. The fastest, of course, was the Exynos 7420, but it was matched by the Kirin 935 in the Huawei Mate S. And then you get very close, the MediaTek Helio X10 and the Snapdragon 801, both at 33 and 34 seconds, respectively. So there's obviously quite a big difference between the uh, Exynos 7420 at 28 seconds compared to the Snapdragon 810 at 43 seconds. Now, as a caveat, some are other things that come into play here, for example, how fast is the flash memory on the particular device. So although this does give us a real world test, it isn't purely just about the SOC, there are other factors included. However, still, the Exynos 7420 in the Note 5 comes out fastest. Now we all use our smartphones for web browsing and how well our smartphone can handle web pages, how well it can handle JavaScript is very important. Therefore, I ran each phone through a test called Kraken, which is a JavaScript performance test to see how well each one performed. Now let's look at the graph. Now in this particular graph, shorter is better. And as we can see, the Exynos 7420 again comes out at top. Followed by that is the Snapdragon 810 with a very good close score, in fact. Then you'll find the Snapdragon 801 performing excellently here and a pretty bad showing by the Helio X10 and the Kirin 935, which are almost double, in fact, almost triple some of the scores from the other processors. The final two benchmarks are ones that I wrote myself. The first one is more of a mathematical raw power one that see how well the processors do in things like calculating SHA1 hashes or finding prime numbers or doing a bubble sort on a very, very large table. Now, after all these things are done, the time that it took to perform all those tasks is displayed and it's displayed in milliseconds. So let's have a look to see what the results are. Now, interestingly enough, the Snapdragon 810 came out top in this particular set of tests with a score of 22,937. Now, remember, shorter is better because it did quicker in this particular set of tests. This was then followed by the Exynos 7420, followed then by the Snapdragon 801. It's not the first time it's come in third place. It still is a very good processor. And then followed by the Kirin 935 and in last place, the Helio X10. So that's a really quite interesting set of results. The Snapdragon 810 came out top, the Snapdragon 801 came in third, and the Exynos 7420 stuck there in the middle between the two. Now the final of my custom benchmarks which I wrote is one that uses a 2D physics engine to simulate water filling up a container. Now the idea is that every frame a new drop of water is added into the container and the physics engine and the CPU need to process all of that physics information to see how the container fills up. Now the program is designed to run at 60 frames per second over a 90 second interval. That means that a maximum of 5,400 drops of water can be added to the container. Now when the SOC cannot keep up with all that work, frames will be dropped and drops of water will not be added into the container. So the maximum score is 5,400 and we'll now see how well those phones did in comparison to each other. So let's have a look at the graph. Now the Exynos 7420 did the best with 5,359, so it almost managed full speed but not quite. Next you have the Snapdragon 801, again performing very, very well with 5,344. Then you have the Helio X10 coming in at 5,255. Very close to that was the Snapdragon 810, but it's a fourth place showing for this particular SOC this time. And finally, the weakest of the bunch for this particular test was the Kirin 935. So what does all this mean? 
Well, first of all, I want to talk about the Snapdragon 801. It really did a great job. In fact, it performed really well against these OptiCore 64-bit processors. In fact, if I had to choose between a phone with a low-end 64-bit processor, let's say the Snapdragon 410 or the Snapdragon 801, I think I would go with the 801 every time. Still got lots of life in it, and I'm sure we're gonna see it in lots of mid-range and maybe in a couple of years' time in low-end phones that will really will still have a lot of life and a lot of longevity in them. So congratulations to Qualcomm for the Snapdragon 801. However, when it comes to the Snapdragon 810 and the Exynos 7420, the Samsung processor is clearly the winner. I think the Samsung processor won almost all of the benchmarks and really the Snapdragon 810 came in behind it, but it always was just that little bit slower. And as for the other two, there's not much to, to choose between them. The Helios X10 and the uh, Kirin 935 are pretty much evenly matched throughout these different benchmarks. Sometimes one was better than the other, but overall, I think it's a probably they're good processors for mid-range phones, maybe mid-high-end phones. And so in a nutshell, the Exynos 7420 is the best processor out there at the moment for Android devices. The Snapdragon 810 comes in close behind it, and then in joint third place, we'll find the Kirin 935 and the Helio X10. But don't forget about the Snapdragon 801. It's still got lots of life in it. Well, my name's Gary Sims from Android Authority. I hope you enjoyed this benchmarking video today. If you did, please do give it a thumbs up. Also, please don't forget to subscribe to Android Authority's YouTube channel. You'll find links here above for subscribing to the YouTube channel and for social media. Also, don't forget to check out what my uh, colleagues and Android Authority are doing with the videos that are linked here on the side. Now, as for me, I'll see you in my next video. Now the last I had this, so, and I'm sure we'll see it more and more in mid-range phones, and then maybe in a year or two in low-end phones, and it real, really will. And then close behind it is the Snapdragon 810, which although it didn't really, really. Uh,